fait en anglais. Tu peux commencer, Jean, juste. Uh, so, uh, I'll speak in English now, so that our speaker can understand what I'm saying about him. Our next speaker is Joel Hamkins, who also wanted to come and really have made a lot of effort to do so, even though at the beginning when I invited him, uh, well, it was almost a year ago, he was still in Oxford. Maybe uh, not everybody here knows that uh, Joel recently moved back to the United States where he took a name chair at the University of Notre Dame in uh, South Bend. Uh, after spending many years as a professor of philosophy in Oxford. Uh, maybe Joel will kindly tell us a little bit more about this move because we haven't seen each other that recently because of the COVID situation. But let me tell you of the previous steps in uh, Joel's career, which are very impressive. Joel was a star student of Hugh Wooden. Uh, it would have been, uh, I would think, in the early 90s. And I've known him for a long time, uh, especially I enjoyed uh, working with him in New York in 2001, when I was uh, spending six months at the CUNY uh, City University, where he also was employed. Uh, we met and wrote a paper together and have kept a very close professional connection ever since. Joel is now, uh, well, he's known for many things, so uh, at the time when we were working together, our interest was actually something that our paper had to do with the notion that Andres introduced in his PhD thesis, a certain kind of large cardinals that we uh, showed something about them uh, is possible. We showed some diamond properties. Uh, Joel got uh, very interested in this just after Andres' thesis. Uh, and then, uh, well, let us go back to uh, Joel's work. He uh, also made a kind of fun name, not uh, purely mathematical, but very important for the, uh, for the let us say, uh, spreading the word in mathematics. Uh, he is very active on math overflow and for some years was the most active member of math overflow. Uh, and contributed many things. And I think this is a very serious and uh, effort in popularizing mathematics and helping young researchers enter in this field. So I think this is wonderful. Joel also has a uh, wonderful blog and uh, website. Yeah, he's very technologically aware. And uh, from if you go to his sites, you will see that his interests are very wide. Uh, as I said, he uh, is a mathematician and a philosopher at the same time. Uh, his interests in philosophy uh, go uh, to foundation of mathematics mostly, and he is mostly known, uh, well, I at least of his work in philosophy have mostly uh, heard comments on, uh, on this paper on multiverses, which I think uh, is among other things is what he was going to talk about today. I just want to uh, read his exact title. And well, you have seen already his uh, abstract. So his ex exact title is Pluralism in the Ontology of Mathematics. I actually share the pluralist perspective that uh, Joel, uh, Joel represents. And I'm looking forward to this talk. Uh, now, Joel, I think you could just share your talk directly from your own account. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, let and me, I'm trying to, okay, here it is. Let's see, share. Okay, is that visible? Yeah, it's all great, yes. And so, you can see uh, my mouse too? Let me just uh, take myself off the screen so that we can see you, that's right. Well, so that uh, your environment looks very nice and <laughs> you can tell us a bit more about that. Very nice to see you, Joel. I do hope that next time you will come here in person and uh, we, well, I'll let you speak. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, it's really a great pity that I'm not able to be there in person. I was looking forward to it so much. 
to be to being there in Paris, I'm sure it would have been great. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to at least speak uh, electronically. And also, please forgive me for speaking in English. I am unable to speak your beautiful language. Uh, and so I'm going to speak in English. Right. So why don't I just start? I think we'll have plenty of time for questions, actually. So feel free to interrupt with questions in the middle. That's completely fine. Um, I'm going to talk about pluralism in the ontology of mathematics. And so uh, onto, uh, ontology, of course, has to do with existence or abstract existence. And so what does it mean to make existence assertions in mathematics uh, is this sort of fundamental question. And is there an ideal mathematical reality that mathematical assertions are about? Uh, and is there more than one such reality, more than one such universe, or perhaps none? Uh, and what ultimately are mathematical objects, for example, what are numbers, what, what kind of thing are they? Uh, and does every mathematical problem have a definite answer? These are the kinds of questions that one might consider in ontology. Uh, does every mathematical assertion have a definite truth value, either it's true or false? Um, Okay, so let's begin with this question. What is the number? If we think about, say, the number 57, what, what is it really? What kind of thing is it? Of course, as a piece of notation, this digits 57 is a kind of recipe. It means five tens plus seven ones. Uh, but of course, we have other notations for that number. In binary, we could write it like this, which means 132 and 116 and 18 and one more, and that's a description of the number 57. Uh, or in Roman numerals, we might write it like this, which is a different recipe, of course, take 50 and five and two more. Uh, so, so we should distinguish between the number and the numeral. These are what we're talking about here are the numerals, the descriptions of the number, which is different maybe from the number itself. <laughs> In the children's novel that I enjoyed as a child, The Phantom Tollbooth, in that book, numbers come from the number mine below the city of Digitopolis and their, their mind in the mine. And in those mines, they found the largest number. It, it was enormous, gigantic. It was a gigantic number three. It was over four meters tall. Uh, made of stone. Okay, again, this is confusing, right? The number with the numeral. The number isn't very big, but the numeral was gigantic. Um, broken numbers were used for fractions. So. Okay, there's lots of different kinds of numbers. Of course, square numbers are the numbers that can be arranged in a square. Uh, triangular numbers are those that can be arranged in the form of a triangle. And we can have hexagonal numbers and so on. There's lots of different kinds of numbers. Uh, and maybe you might think about the palindromic numbers. These are the numbers that are like a palindrome. So they read the same forwards and backwards like the phrase, I prefer pi, if you read it backwards, it's just the same. But mathematicians often don't like this concept of palindromic numbers because it's not actually a property of the number, but rather of the numeral, again, because it depends on the base. If you write the number in a different base, then it might not be palindromic anymore. And so uh, this is, so, so the concept of palindromic numbers is again, making that same confusion between the number and the numeral. I guess every number is palindromic. Exactly. Five. That's what it says right here. Every number is a palindrome <laughs> in a sufficiently large base. Yes. So, so, uh, so that just makes the point even more strongly, in my opinion. Okay. There's a confounding case, maybe again, with this number numeral. Well, we, we have these familiar fractions, one half or three six, and we maybe say this one is in lowest terms. And this one is not in lowest terms, but yet in the next breath, we're gonna say that they're equal. Uh, so these two numbers are identical, but one of them has the property of being in lowest terms and one of them doesn't. And isn't that confusing? Uh, because how can they be identical if one of them has a property that the other one doesn't have? This violates Leibniz's principle um, on the indiscernibility of identicals. Uh, but of course, it doesn't really, because the property of being in lowest terms is not a property, again, of the number, but rather of the numeral, of the representation of the number, 
the fraction viewed as a kind of name of the number is what is what's in lowest terms or not in lowest terms. The number itself, it doesn't make sense to say if it's in lowest terms. Okay, so of course, there's a whole list of different philosophical attitudes that you can take uh, towards the nature of mathematical existence assertions. And here's just this kind of list of different philosophical positions, Platonism and formalism and so on. And maybe some of these are familiar. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these. Um, so according to the philosophical position known as Platonism, numbers and other mathematical objects it enjoy uh, in existence as abstract objects in the realm of ideal forms. So a particular line or circle drawn on paper is imperfect. It's not perfectly circular or the line isn't perfectly thin, but in the platonic realm, there is a perfect circle. It's perfectly round and the line is perfectly thin. Uh, and so the same with numbers and functions and sets. So we imagine this kind of ideal realm of abstract objects and in those objects those are where the mathematical objects have a real existence and so to make an existence assertion in mathematics according to the philosophy of platonism is can be taken literally if you say there is a function which has uh, which is discontinuous a function on the reals which is discontinuous at exactly one point uh, then uh, then we can take you at your word in the platonic realm there is such a function the philosophy of structuralism, according to this philosophy, it doesn't matter what numbers are taken as individuals. The structuralist uh, considers the structural role that a number plays in a system exhibiting an overall structure. So for example, the integer zero is in the, in the integer ring is the additive identity. Uh, and it's playing the role of being the additive identity. It's the only integer also a different uh, characterization of the number zero is that it's an additive item potent. It's the only integer number Z, which when added to itself gives itself back. So that's a kind of description of the structural role that the number zero plays in the integers. And it doesn't matter what zero is. All that matters is that it's playing that role in that integer ring. So Dedekind gave a very important structuralist account of the natural numbers. So the natural numbers 0, 1, 2, and so on. And he identified the fundamental principles that we might uh, assert for this structure in the language with a successor operation. Namely, 0 is not a successor. The successor means like adding 1. 0 is not a successor, but the successor operation is 1 to 1, so that if the successor of x is the same thing as the successor of y, that's if and only if x equal y. So it's a one-to-one -one function and zero is not in the range. And also every number is generated from zero by the successor operation, which can be stated like this. If you have a set of numbers and it contains zero and is closed under the successor operation, so any number in the set has its successor also in the set, then A has all the numbers. Okay, this is called the induction principle. And then it follows, Dedekind proved and Piano proved using Dedekind's axioms that all the familiar arithmetic truths follow as consequences from this theory. So this, these three axioms characterize the natural number, the theory of the natural numbers in, and the theory can be developed as a consequence of these principles. But Dedekind proves something more and something very important about his axioms, namely they are categorical. And that means that his axioms determine a unique mathematical structure. Any two different models of Dedekind arithmetic are copies of one another, isomorphic copies of one another. So if, I, if you have your natural numbers with your zero and your successor operation, and I have a competing natural numbers with a zero, and maybe a different number zero and a different successor operation, then we can prove that they're isomorphic. Um, so we can match up your zero with my zero and the successor of zero and the successor and so on. And defining by recursion, the isomorphism and Dedekind proof that in such a theory, uh, definitions by recursion are legitimate. And that's how he proved his categoricity result. Okay, so according to the philosophy of structuralism, we don't have to say anything more about what numbers are 
except to say that they fulfill the dedicated axioms of arithmetic because this completely determines them up to structural isomorphism. So this is already a sense of pluralism. The structuralist attitude in mathematics is a pluralist attitude because it doesn't care about the uniqueness of the mathematical objects and it takes isomorphic copies of the structure uh, as equally good. Okay, so Dedekind, well, when it comes to the real numbers, Dedekind observed how every real number is determined by the cut it makes in the rational line. So if we think about the rational line, then a real number divides the rationals into two pieces, you know, the ones below and the ones above. And, and he postulated that the real numbers are complete in the sense that if I could imagine to a separation of the real line into two pieces such that everything in the left piece was below everything in the right piece, um, then there should be one and only one real number that is forming that cut. You know? and, he, and then he went on to say, if we knew for certain that space was discontinuous, if there was a hole in the real line, then there would be nothing to prevent us from filling up its gaps in thought. We could imagine a point and put that imaginary point there, that abstract thing, we can imagine it being there and thus make it complete. So he postulated that the real line should be considered as complete. Every cut should be filled. Um, now Russell actually mocked him a bit for this, uh, for this attitude because uh, Russell explained a little more carefully how to construct the real line, the real numbers using Dedekind cuts. And he said of Dedekind, the method of postulating what we want has many advantages. They are the same as the advantages of theft over honest toil. Let us leave them to others and proceed with our honest toil. So what he was talking about is Dedekind was postulating that the real line is complete, but what Russell did was undertake the honest toil of putting an ordered field structure on the set of all Dedekind cuts on the rationals and proving that that structure is Dedekind complete. So he, he gave the familiar construction of the real numbers via Dedekind cuts in the rationals. And on that account, there's a way of thinking about what it's doing. It's providing a copy of the real numbers as a Dedekind cut. Every real number is a Dedekind cut in this construction. So of course, there's other ways to build the real numbers. So an alternative concept is provided by Cauchy, who was inspired by the idea that every real number is the limit of a sequence of rational numbers. And we can have maybe two different sequences converging to the same real number. And one can give an account uh, of that by thinking of uh, Cauchy sequences. And so, so he formed the Cauchy completion of the rational line using the equivalence classes of those Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. It's a different way of understanding what real numbers are, but in fact, it's isomorphic. Um, and so Hilbert had identified the natural properties that we want in the real numbers. And in contemporary language, what he specified uh, in effect was that the real should be a complete ordered field so the real numbers with plus and times have a field structure, an algebraic structure, and they're ordered. And that order is Dedekind complete. And this is what it means to be a complete ordered field. And then Huntington proved uh, in 1903 that all complete ordered fields are isomorphic. This is an analog of Dedekind's categoricity result, but for the real numbers. The real numbers enjoy this categoricity result. Any two complete ordered fields are isomorphic. Um, okay, so, so ultimately then, what is the number, say, pi, if we take a number pi or e or square root of two or any number, what is it as a mathematical object? So is it a Dedekind cut? Or is it an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences? Or is it a length of some kind, maybe a purely geometric object? Or is it something else? And for the structuralist, and most mathematicians are structuralists these days, it just doesn't matter. It's the wrong question to ask, what is a number actually? Rather, the reals are any structure that, is, that has the property of being a complete ordered field. And it doesn't matter which copy you use, they're all just as good because they're all isomorphic to each other. This is the structuralist attitude uh, towards uh, 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 identity um, characterizations of mathematical objects. 
Okay, so according to this philosophy of structuralism, real numbers are comprehended by their roles within a larger structure. So for example, if you think about the real number square root of two, the algebraic number, in any complete ordered field, what this object is, is the unique positive number that squares to the number two. And where two is the number one plus one, where one is the unique multiplicative identity. So we can give a kind of description of what it means to be the square root of two, the role played by the square root of two. And, uh, and, and that's really all we have to say if we are structuralists. Okay, so in any complete order field, every rational number is definable and every real number is characterized by how it cuts the rational numbers. And so any two different real numbers play a different role in the structure of the ordered real field. So let's go to the complex numbers. There's this funny thing that happens. If, we, if we're given the real numbers, we can make the complex numbers uh, by thinking about the enticing or perhaps terrifying possibility of the square root of negative one. So I is the imaginary unit and I squared is minus one. So I is the square root of minus one. And we wanna think about complex numbers of the form A plus B I where A and B are real numbers. Um, okay, so we said that the imaginary unit I is the square root of minus one. Um, but which one, which square root? Actually, there are two square roots, of course, of minus one, because minus i also is a square root. If I square minus i, so minus i times minus i, then I can factor the minus one out, and I also get minus one. And so the question is, how can you tell i and minus i apart in the complex field? And the answer is that you cannot. There is no property in, uh, expressible in the language of fields that, uh, that distinguishes i and minus i. And the reason is that, yes, question? So i and minus i have exactly the same properties in terms of the field structure of the complex numbers precisely because there's an automorphism. There's an isomorphism of the complex field with itself that swaps I and, I, I and minus I, it's called complex conjugation. It maps A plus BI to A minus BI. So that's like flipping the plane, taking I to minus I, swapping them really. And therefore any property that's true about I in the complex field will also be true about minus I and there is no way to tell them apart. And therefore, if you're a structuralist, you can't identify the mathematical object with the structural role that the object plays in a structure because some structures like the complex field have the property that some numbers, there are two numbers that play the same role. I and minus I play exactly the same role in the complex field precisely because they're automorphic. There's an automorphism of the field that swaps them. Okay, so maybe when I talk about I, it's actually the same thing as your minus I, and we would never know. Okay, so of course, this problem is easy to solve by imposing extra structure and not just looking at the complex field as a field only, so not only with its algebraic structure of plus and times, but rather we can put the geometric structure on, we think of the coordinate structure, and then this is a way of thinking about the complex plane rather than the complex field. So the complex plane is the, the points A comma B in the plane, and we have their coordinates uh, as real numbers. And so now I is the point zero comma one, and minus I is the point zero comma minus one. And then of course, with these points, we can define suitable addition and multiplication. So if you wanna multiply complex numbers, then this is the, the, in effect what you're doing. And so we can build a copy of the complex uh, numbers using pairs of real numbers. And so there's nothing really so mysterious about uh, the complex numbers after all. Okay, so, so the complex field is interpretable in the real field, not just as a field, but as a field with coordination with the coordinate structure, the real and imaginary part. It's interesting actually that the converse interpretation is not true. You cannot interpret the real field in the complex field. It's an interesting little result. Okay, so let's 
let me tell a little allegory about how we think about the Platonism with respect to the real numbers and the complex numbers. So suppose at your death, you're astonished to meet God in heaven who says, yes, you are completely right about Platonism for the real numbers. There they are. And you see the real line before you and each number in its place where you expect it. Okay, uh, so there's the pi and e and so on, each of them there with a real existence in the Platonic realm. Uh, but then God continues, you were wrong about Platonism for the complex numbers. You have to construct them from the reals with pairs using parentheses and comma and everything. Um, and wouldn't there be something absurd about this to have a different attitude about the real existence of the real numbers versus the real existence of the complex numbers? I would find that completely absurd. It seems that we need to have a kind of uh, uh, affinity or parallelism in our attitude about Platonism for the real numbers and Platonism for the complex numbers. And I'm going to argue later that maybe there's a similar kind of attitude that we should take uh, towards the set theoretic universe and, for example, its forcing extensions. Okay, there's also a kind of type theoretic account of numbers. So every natural number is commonly also taken as an integer. If you have the number 57 as a natural number, then maybe you think 57 is also an integer and also a rational number and a real number and a complex number. And so mathematicians would commonly write these inclusions and maybe they identify each number in each uh, mathematical structure with it. Uh, with the same number can be viewed as in any of those. Okay. But the type theorists, the type theorists insist that no, no, it's fruitful to pay attention to these type distinctions. And we should not say that the integer 57 is actually the same as the real number 57, because we're changing the type from being an integer type to being a real number type. And so we should think about these structures as different and their elements that inhabit those types uh, are different. Okay, so we have kind of type changing translations maybe. So we could put subscripts. So this is the the rational number, it, this translates the integer number 57 into a rational number, or maybe we translate the integer 57 into a real number by thinking about these type changing morphisms perhaps. Um, but are our arithmetic calculations really written through with those invisible type changing morphisms? So when we do a calculation and we switch from thinking about a number as an integer to a number as a real number, then are we really applying these type changing morphisms? I'm not so sure, um, because it seems in contemporary mathematical practice, we do make an identity uh, of these different number types. Okay. If you're a programmer, then maybe you're familiar with this when you have to change the type of a variable from integer to float or something, if that's familiar to you. Okay, I want to think about these categoricity results. So the categoricity arguments for the natural numbers and for the real numbers, which I had mentioned are important for structuralism, are essentially set theoretic axioms. So when we had characterized the natural numbers by induction, we were concerned with arbitrary subsets of the natural numbers. We said for any set of natural numbers, if it contains zero and is closed and a successor, then it's everything. And in the real numbers, we had this completeness property, which said for any bounded set, for any cut, then there's a real number realizing that cut. And so, so really, we have to understand those categorical theories in the context of set theory. Those are characterizations in what's known as second order logic, which uh, has to do with arbitrary subsets of a domain and can be seen as a part of set theory. And so the question is, is that a problem for structuralism? If we want to understand the sort of definiteness and fundamental nature of the natural numbers, then the categorical account tells us what we're talking about. It, it pins down the structure uniquely, but it's relying on these concepts of arbitrary set. And, and, and how can it possibly be that we're going to get a definite account of what a natural number means of these finite numbers by appealing to this sort of comparatively murky realm of arbitrary sets of numbers? And so it seems like there's something a bit uh, fishy about the appeal to the categoricity results in order to gain definiteness even of fin the finite numbers. 
So set theory as a foundation, it was initially a tool that was brought into other mathematical domains. So Dedekind had considered arbitrary sets of numbers and Cantor had, was looking at initially sets of real numbers, closed sets of real numbers and doing, for example, the cantor bendixson process of casting out isolated points. Um, but gradually the capacity of set theory to express essentially any abstract mathematical structure emerged. And set theory began in that way to serve as an ontological foundation for the rest of mathematics, for all of mathematics. So it, it, I think it's fair to say that to be precise in, in mid 20th century mathematics often came to mean to specify one's mathematical structure set theoretically. What is a group? Well, a group is a set together with a certain binary operation on that set and uh, having the group axioms. And what is a binary operation? Well, it's a function. It, Sort of, uh, it's a, a a relation. It's really a set of pairs, or it's a if it's a binary function, it's a set of triples whose first two coordinates relate to the output of the function. So, and so, to be precise means to give a set theoretic account of your mathematical structures. Okay. So, and and. Uh, and, and Hilbert had recognized this and there's this famous quotation, no one shall cast us from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. He recognized the role that set theory was playing in the foundations of mathematics. Um, Moskovakis summarized the attitude in his set theory book. Uh, we will discover within the universe of sets faithful representations of all the mathematical objects we need and we will study set theory on the basis of the axiomatic system of Zermelo, as if all mathematical objects were sets. Okay, so it doesn't have to be part of this claim that mathematical objects are sets, but rather just that set theory has the capacity to consider copies of those objects. And so we can study them as if they were sets. This is what faithful representation means. And, and Moskovakis explains that um, what it means to have a faithful representation of the ideas and, and fundamental operations and structural things that you want to do with the structure should be possible to implement in the uh, set theoretic domain. Okay, so in this way, set theory had become a grand unified theory of mathematics. So that was historically very important because before there was this common unifying foundation, there were different parts of mathematics, algebra and topology and geometry and so on. And maybe sometimes people, mathematicians would wanna use a theorem from one realm and apply it in another. We wanna use notions from topology and analysis in order to prove something in algebra, like the fact that the complex field is algebraically closed and someone we're mixing together these different fields of mathematics. And that would be logically incoherent unless there was a single uh, subject, a single logical framework that one could view all of those different mathematical activities as a part of. And that's what set theory provided. It was this sort of unified logical framework in which one could view all of the rest of mathematics as taking place. And so it becomes coherent then to apply results from one field of mathematics in another. Um, so the, the, let me talk a little about the iterative conception with which Boban had mentioned in his talk just before. So the set theoretic universe is built in an iterative sequence of stages. Maybe we begin with some primitive objects, the Ur elements, so maybe these are not sets, but mathematical objects out of which we're going to build the sets. And we make this vast hierarchy. So at the bottom, we have the Ur elements, and then at the next stage, we have sets of our elements and then sets of sets of our elements and sets and sets of those and so on. And we can keep going forever in a very long way. So this is called the, the, the iterative conception of set. We start with the basic primitive objects and then we iteratively form sets out of the objects that we already have. Now, of course, maybe some of the sets we built don't involve the Ur elements in any way because we have the empty set and then the set contained in the empty set and so on. We can, we can build sets, actually the pure sets that don't have any involvement with the Ur elements. And set theorists quickly realized that in fact, we don't need the Ur elements for any mathematical purpose. And the reason is that any mathematical structure in set theory with Ur elements can be found isomorphically within the pure sets. And therefore, 
the subject of set theory becomes um, simpler if we just don't have any or elements. So according to the philosophy of structuralism, the realm of pure sets alone uh, serves just as well as the foundation of mathematics and, and uh, implements those unifying idea. Okay, so then we get the cumulative universe and this picture maybe looks a little more like what Boban was talking about. So we have the cumulative universe of pure sets. This is a realm, a mathematical realm containing copies of every conceivable mathematical structure, yet in this realm, everything is a set. Uh, and this is the foundational view, set theoretic foundationalism. Sort of the entirety of mathematics consists of sets, sets of sets, sets of sets of sets, and so on in a vast hierarchy founded ultimately upon the empty set. So sets accumulate transfinitely to form the universe of all sets. And the, the orthodox view maybe among set theorists has this twofold realist nature. First of all, we view mathematical objects as sets, okay? Not, not that they have to be, but that they can be viewed that way. And second, those sets enjoy a real mathematical existence. So this is the, the Platonist part of the view accumulating to form the universe of all sets. Okay, a principal task of set theory on that view is to discover what are the fundamental truths of that cumulative set theoretic universe? What is true in that universe? Um, and those truths will include all of the fundamental mathematical truths. On the traditional view, the set theoretic universe is seen as unique. It's the universe of all sets. It's built according to that process that I described, the, the iterative conception. And in particular, on that view, every set theoretic question, such as the continuum hypothesis or others, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, uh, every set theoretic question has a definitive final answer in that universe, if it's unique. Um, and so this is a way of kind of settling the ontological problem. And what remains is the epistemological problem about knowledge. How shall we discover what those truths are? Okay. So the universe view is the view, is the position that there's a unique absolute background concept of set, which is instantiated in the cumulative universe of all sets in which set theoretic assertions have a definite truth value. So the universe view is a kind of determinist view for set theoretic truth, and therefore also for mathematical truth. Every mathematical question will have an answer in that set theoretic realm, that unique set theoretic realm. Okay. So Daniel Isaacson, a philosopher in Oxford, sharply distinguishes between particular and general mathematical structure. And he uh, mentions sort of two fundamentally different uses of axioms. So on the one hand, axioms express our knowledge about a particular structure, such as the Dedekind axioms of the natural numbers or the, um, the, the characterization of the real numbers as a complete ordered field. Those are expressing what we know to be true about these structures, these intended structures. But also we can use axioms to define a general class of structures like the class of all groups or fields or orders. And this is more like defining a collection of structures rather than characterizing a single structure. So in the first category, the, the axioms often have the character of self-evident truths. Um, uh, but uh, in the second case, it's more like definition. So these particular structures like the natural numbers and the real numbers are found by mathematical experience and then characterized as unique with these categoricity results. Um, and so for Isaacson, the point is that the cumulative universe of set theory is such a particular mathematical structure, which is characterized in second order logic. So Tony Martin gave a philosophical argument that there is at most one structure meeting the concept of set. So assuming what he calls the uniqueness postulate that every set is determined uniquely by its members, any two structures meeting the what he called the weak conception of set must agree. So basically, it's like the categoricity argument of Dedekind. For Martin, if you have a, a model of, if you have a universe of set theory over here and I have a different one over here, then he says, well, we can assume that their ordinals are the same because it's a kind of absoluteness uh, for being the concept of ordinal. And if each of these concepts of set uh, is aspiring to include all the sets, then we can build up the isomorphism rank by rank. 
because whatever, uh, if we have an isomorphism of some initial segment of this conception with an initial segment of this one, then for any set that is appearing in the other one, we can pull it back by the partial isomorphism we have so far, and that's going to be a set over here. And so we can keep going in this iterative manner and show ultimately that the two conceptions of set are isomorphic. There's a big if in this question about this, um, that each of them is capable of seeing the other one and that the ordinals are comparable and so on. That's the categoricity argument of Tony Martin. So the universe view, the view that I mentioned that there's only one set theoretic universe uh, it's often combined with consequentialism as a criterion for truth, precisely because we don't have a good solution of the epistemological problem of how we come to know what is true there. And so, uh, so we look at sort of consequences of axioms, and when those consequences look really good, then we take that as evidence for the truth of those axioms. So set theorists will point uh, to the increasingly stable body of regularity features flowing from the large cardinal hierarchy. For example, the deterministic consequences that Boban had mentioned uh, as consequences of large cardinals and, and other many extremely welcome results, uniformization results in the projective hierarchy for sets of reals and so on. All of those things look really nice and great. And that's taken uh, uh, as evidence for the truth of those large cardinal axioms. Okay, this is consequentialism. We, we judge the truth of a principle by whether it has extremely welcome and explanatory consequences. Okay, so let me turn now to a different way of thinking, namely a difficulty for the universe view. And that is the central discovery in set theory over the past half century or more is the enormous range of set theoretic possibility. Uh, so the most powerful set theoretic tools that we have are most naturally understood as methods of constructing alternative set theoretic universes, universes that seem fundamentally set theoretic. So I'm speaking of forcing and ultra powers, canonical inner models, and so on. We have many different methods of building alternative set theoretic universes. Um, and much of set theory research has been about constructing as many different models of set theory as possible. So these models are often made to exhibit uh, extremely precise exacting features or to exhibit specific relationships to other models. So the continuum hypothesis, for example, is the assertion that every set of real numbers is either countable or equinumerous with the real numbers. So it's a way of saying that there's no infinity. Cantor proved that the reals are uncountable and the continuum hypothesis is the assertion that there is no infinity between the infinity of the natural numbers and the infinity of the real numbers. And he struggled with this hypothesis and whether it's true or not his entire life and was never able to settle it either way. In fact, it was several decades. Well, this was a major open question for Cantor. And it was the at the top of Hilbert's famous list of problems that guided mathematical research for the next century. It was number one. Uh, it took decades before Gödel had proved finally that CH is true in the constructible universe. So Gödel constructed this artificial set theoretic universe and proved that the continuum hypothesis is true there. Uh, and then it was still another 20 years or more that until Cohen proved that there, there's another artificial set theoretic universe in which the continuum hypothesis is false. And these two results together show that the continuum hypothesis is, is independent of the other axioms of set theory, because both of these models satisfy the ZFC axioms of set theory. And so therefore, uh, ZFC is consistent with the continuum hypothesis being true and also consistent with the continuum hypothesis being false. So we cannot prove it one way or the other, just from these axioms. Okay, let me imagine an alternative history. So let's suppose that set theory had followed a different history than it had, has. So let's suppose that as set theory developed, theorems were increasingly developed, I mean, settled in the base theory, that there would be open questions, but then eventually those questions would be settled, say, in ZFC. And that the independence phenomenon imagined that it was limited 
to those weird paradoxical meta logic statements, the self referential statements of Gödel and so on, and that the independence phenomenon was just only occurring with those weird statements. Okay, but sort of ordinary mathematical statements were increasingly settled in the base theory. And maybe we could even imagine that the few true independence results were settled by missing but naturally self evident set principles. I'm thinking of something like, okay, the addition of the axiom of choice as an axiom, uh, the axiom of choice enjoys enormous intuitive support, sort of intrinsic support, because set theorists often view it as um, expressing a fundamental truth about what we expect to be true in a realm that includes all possible sets, then there should be a set making those choice functions, whether or not we could describe uh, how to do so. Or also, for example, the way that the replacement axiom was added to the Zermelo theory to form zermelo frankel theory um, uh, can be seen as an instance of this. Okay, so if set theory had developed like that, then that would be evidence for the universe view. It would be, yeah, we've got the right theory. We're answering all the questions. Things are more and more settled in that theory. And there isn't any kind of fundamental independence except for these weird metalogic statements that, um, that maybe aren't as important as the other ones. Okay. But the actual history of set theory is nothing like this picture that I just described. Rather, it's just a complete chaotic jumble of set theoretic possibility. Basically, everything is independent in set theory. We have this diversity of models of set theory. Whole parts of set theory exhaustively explore the various combinations of statements that we can realize. I'm thinking of the subject of cardinal invariance of the continuum. So do you want the bounding number equal to the dominating number or strictly less and so on? And, and so the, the uh, would you like to have the continuum hypothesis or the negation? Or do you want CH plus not diamond? Or would you like two to the Aleph N equal to Aleph N plus two for all N? Do you want Suslin trees or no Suslin trees, Grepa trees, Martin's axiom? Okay, we have dozens and dozens and dozens, hundreds of different set theoretic statements in diverse combinations, and we can build models basically to order. You tell us what you want, and we can often build it. So let me illustrate a little bit about how one can achieve this kind of situation. So let's, let's imagine undertaking set theory in the context of multi-valued truth. So we don't just have true and false in this conception now, but I want to imagine that I have a whole algebra of truth values, a Boolean algebra of possible truth values. Um, so, so in this way of thinking now, when I make a, an assertion, say A is an element of B, it won't just be true or false, but the truth value will be some element of this algebra of truth, this algebra of truth values. Maybe it will be fully true, maybe it will be completely false, or maybe it will have some intermediate value taken from this Boolean algebra B. Now, if you have this way of thinking, then uh, you can build the cumulative hierarchy with those kinds of sets, sets that have the property that membership is defined only with truth value in B instead of just zero and one value. Um, and you can form the cumulative hierarchy in this way of thinking about what sets are. And you get this, you get this cumulative hierarchy, this B valued uh, cumulative hierarchy. And the amazing fact, this is basically the essence of forcing. The amazing fact is that different choices of the complete Boolean algebra B will lead to set theoretic universes with different truths for many of these fundamental questions. If you pick a certain kind of B, then the universe that you build there will have the continuum hypothesis being true, definitely true with truth value one, or you can make it definitely false, or you can make it have some intermediate value depending on the choice of B. So many fundamental statements, I'm taking, I'm talking about hundreds of different statements of set theory can be made to have their truth values change if we have this slightly more general conception of what the cumulative universe is like. Um, now, it's interesting to point out also that if you use a, what's called a Boolean algebra, then you're always going to still have classical logic in all of these uh, set theoretic realms. So we're not giving up the law of excluded middle or anything like that, just because it's multi-valued. If we use a Boolean algebra, then all classical validities will still be fully true 
Um, but it, actually, the construction works even if you don't use a Boolean algebra. You could use a hiding algebra or one of the paraconsistent algebras and do exactly the same construction. And then you get these alternative set theoretic realms which validate only intuitionistic logic or paraconsistent logic and so on. But the fundamental idea of them is identical uh, to what's going on in these B value sets. Okay, so, uh, so the result of all of this is that the fundamental object of study has really become the model of set theory. I think the majority of papers published in set theory are about constructing a certain kind of model of set theory to have some features or other. Um, and so we have the constructible universe and relativized constructibility and inner models with large cardinals and we have forcing extensions, ultra powers, we cut off the universe in various ways. We do relative constructibility, the hereditarily ordinal definable sets and so on. So forcing especially has led to a staggering variety of these models. We're constructing different set theoretic universes all the time. So this is how I describe it. Set theory has discovered an entire cosmos of set theoretic universes connected by forcing or large cardinal embeddings like lines in a constellation filling a dark night sky. Okay, there's a way of thinking about this that makes makes set theory seem to have a kind of category theoretic nature. Okay, all of this is a challenge for the universe view to explain this central phenomenon, the phenomenon of the enormous diversity of set theoretic possibility. So the universe view, the idea that there's only one universe and everything has an absolute truth value, if only we could figure out what it is, uh, uh, is fundamentally at odds with the, this plethora of different alternative set theoretic possibility. It seems like the universist has to explain away these all these different other alternative universes as being imaginary. Um, and in particular, I would argue that it doesn't seem sufficient. If you're going to argue for the universe view, it's not good enough to just find a really great axiom uh, that has really great consequences because that is not explaining, or even if it's true that your axiom is really great, uh, it, doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't explain away all of those other universes that we already know about and which seem perfectly set theoretic to us. Just because you have a really great house, a mansion, it doesn't mean it's the only house on the street, even if it is really great. And so if you're going to argue for universism, then you have to not only provide the really great axiom that is uh, clarifying and, uh, and so on, you have to explain away the, um, the, the vision, uh, the, the, what it's like of all these other alternative universes that we know are perfectly good. Okay, so the competing position then is what I call the multiverse view or pluralist set theory, this is the position holding that there are many different set theoretic universes, numerous distinct concepts of set, not just one absolute concept of set, and each one uh, corresponds to the universe of sets to which it gives rise. So amongst these different conceptions of set are all of the different models of set theory that fill our set theoretic research papers, and not just the ones obtained by forcing, but by any of the set theoretic construction methods we're talking about. Okay, so, uh, so the key observation is that uh, uh, from any given concept of set, we're able to generate many new concepts of set relative to that concept. So if you have a concept of set with universe W, then we can talk about the constructible universe relative to W or the ordinal definable sets relative to W or L of R of W and so on, the forcing extensions of W and ultra powers and so on. And so it's a kind of relative, uh, uh, multiversism often um, because we can describe a new concept of set in relation to a given concept of set. And I find this extremely fascinating actually because the concepts of set are often closely enough related uh, that they can be analyzed mathematically. And so what might have been a purely philosophical answer enterprise, I mean it's a maybe a purely philosophical question, what are the different concepts of set and what are they like and so on. But because the concept of set are closely enough connected in many cases, we can 
uh, undertake a mathematical analysis of how closely connected they are and the nature of how truth is affected and absoluteness results and things of that nature. And so it's this wonderful combination of philosophy and mathematics. Okay, so I want also to emphasize that the multiverse view is a brand of realism. So the alternative set theoretic universes arise from different concepts of set and each, each of them uh, can be seen as giving rise to a universe fully as real as the universe of sets on the universe view. Okay, so it used to be when I was a graduate student decades ago that when, when someone said they were a Platonist, what they meant was the uniqueness was part of it. There was a unique set theoretic realm and it and had definitive answers to the questions of whether CH is true or not. But I think these days we can separate Platonism from this uniqueness question because the multiversist uh, view can also be seen as Platonist if we have the real existence of these alternative set theoretic uh, realms, okay. So it's Platonism about universes. So Platonism really should be about whether the existence assertions are taken as real and not whether there's a unique realm. The, the multiverse view has very strong affinities with the view of Mark Balliger known as plenitudinous Platonism or alternatively full-blooded Platonism. So this is the view expressed intuitively that uh, all possible mathematical objects exist. So for any coherent theory, then there are real mathematical objects that that theory is about. This is, uh, uh, one can view the multiverse view as basically an instance of this plenitudinous Platonism. Let me draw an analogy, which I think is extremely strong between set theory and geometry. So, for thousands of years, geometry studied concepts like points and lines and planes with a seemingly clear absolute meaning. The subject was viewed as about geometry. There was one subject of geometry, but those fundamental concepts were shattered with the rise and discovery of non-Euclidean geometry. And we suddenly realized that now actually there were distinct geometrical universes that had different geometrical truths. So of course, at first, the first consistency arguments uh, were basically simulating non-Euclidean geometry inside Euclidean geometry. If you take the sphere and you redefine, reinterpret what you mean by a line to mean a great circle on the sphere, a circle whose center is the center of the sphere. Um, and that gives an account of spherical geometry. So, so Inside Euclidean geometry, we can talk about spheres and great circles, and we can give an interpretation of non-Euclidean geometry. Or if you think about the Poincaré disk, this is a model of uh, hyperbolic geometry inside Euclidean geometry. But actually, it's interesting to know that there are simulations the other way, too. We can simulate, we can interpret Euclidean geometry inside hyperbolic geometry and so on. There's, the, the, the theories are mutually interpretable. Um, and, and actually geometers in time accepted these alternative geometries, not just as these sort of artificial or simulations within Euclidean geometry, but as fully real. And they came to develop intuitions about what is it like to live in hyperbolic space? And what is the nature of walking around in hyperbolic space? And I think today, geometers have a truly deep understanding of those alternative geometries. And no one regards the alternative geometries as illusory or fake or artificial. They are genuine geometries. It, the analogy extends to the way we reason about these different subjects. So geometers specify different geometries. Well, they can view them externally as embedded spaces, as I was describing, like the Poincaré disk model. Um, but also we can study the alternative geometries internally by jumping inside them and walking around and, and, and developing intuitions about what it's like in those geometric spaces. But we can also study geometries abstractly, for example, in the Erlangen program by using isometry groups to specify a geometry often means to specify the group of transformations for which those geometric concepts are preserved. Okay, there's extremely similar modes of reasoning that arise with forcing, namely, 
We can understand the forcing extension from the perspective of the ground model by, by using names and the forcing relation. This is like a simulated version of the forcing extension inside the ground model. Or we can understand the forcing extension by jumping inside that model and reasoning what it's like in V of G in the forcing extension uh, by a particular forcing notion. Or we can also understand the forcing extension by analyzing, say, automorphisms of the Boolean algebras. So these three modes of reasoning are basically similar to these three geometric modes of reasoning. Um, okay, so let me mention another quotation of Isaacson. So about this analogy. So the independence of the fifth postulate, that's the parallel postulate, reflects the fact that there are different geometries. It makes no sense to ask whether the parallel postulate is really true or not. Okay, so uh, by contrast, the independence of the continuum hypothesis does not establish, this is according to Isaacson, um, the existence of a multiplicity of set theory. So in a sense, made precise and established by the use of second order logic, He's referring essentially to the uh, uh, something like the Tony Martin argument here. There is only one set theory of the continuum, and it remains an open question whether in that set theory CH holds or not. Okay, so let me, I would like to criticize that view, and I'm going to talk about uh, the, what I call the dream solution template for the continuum hypothesis. So set theorists yearn for a definitive solution to the continuum hypothesis. Uh, uh, what would be great is this kind of pattern here, what I call the dream solution. To, to, to really have a dream solution of CH, you should produce a set theoretic assertion phi, which expresses a manifestly true set theoretic principle. So that as soon as you mention phi, everyone will say, yes, that's part of my concept of set. I want to accept phi as an axiom. So, and then you should prove that that new axiom that you discovered determines the continuum hypothesis, either that it implies it or that it implies the negation. Okay, this is the dream solution of the continuum hypothesis. Everyone would accept phi because of its manifestly true nature, and therefore everyone would either accept CH or not CH because of these implications that you prove from phi. The missing axiom. Okay. My argument is that this will never happen. Uh, and the reason is we already have a rich experience in worlds having CH and others having not CH that are fully legitimately set theoretic. We already know what it's like to live in a set theoretic universe where CH is true or where CH is false. And that fact will prevent us from ever accepting phi as manifestly true if we know that it decides CH. So in other words, if the dream solution succeeds in the second step, it will exactly undermine the first step. Even if you get me to agree or someone to agree that phi seems true, then as soon as you prove that it implies CH, they'll say, oh, wait a minute. Oh, well, I can't really accept that as manifestly true anymore because I, I know about these not CH worlds that are per perfectly acceptable set theoretically. So any specific dream solution proposal will be rejected from a position of deep familiarity and experience with the contrary situation. So, okay, so we know that the continuum hypothesis is independent of ZFC, um, but we know actually much more than just that independence. So independence just means that there is one model where it's true and one model where it's false. But in fact, we can show Every set theoretic universe has a forcing extension in which C8 holds and another in which it's fault, in which it fails. You can force it to be true and you can force it to be false. Um, so you can turn it on and off like a light switch just by making these sort of minor changes to the set theoretic universe. Um, and furthermore, those forcing notions can preserve many other uh, set theoretic features for such as the existence of large cardinals and so on. We don't need to destroy any large cardinals or create new ones in order to flip this light switch. Okay, so we have this rich experience in those models and they seem fully set theoretic. Uh, so let me turn the tables on Isaacson by saying it's not merely that CH is formally independent and we don't know anything more, but rather we have an informed deep understanding of of how it is that the continuum hypothesis could hold or fail and how to build these set theoretic universes from one another. 
And so if a proposed axiom settled CH, then we won't look at it as intrinsic since we already understand deeply how it could fail. It would be like someone having a principle that they were claiming was manifestly true uh, that implied only Brooklyn existed. But I already know about Manhattan and the other boroughs. I've been there. Uh, and so I've already know how CH could hold and how it can fail in a deep way. And so the dream solution cannot succeed. Okay, so on the multiverse perspective, the continuum hypothesis question is not an open question. It's incorrect to describe the CH as an open question. So the answer to the CH question consists in precisely that detailed, deep understanding that I was talking about of how it holds and fails throughout the multiverse of how those models are connected to one another and the absoluteness results about how to achieve CH or the negation uh, while preserving uh, uh, or creating other kind of set theoretic situations. Of course, we don't know everything about it, but I would say that the most important and essential facts are known and deeply understood. And that is the answer to the CH question. Um, so, okay, so we can't prove it and it's independent of the axioms, but still the mathematicians wanna know, is it true? You know, but this is exactly the question we've been talking about. The question seems innocent, but interpreting it in a sensible way leads, in my opinion, to these extremely difficult philosophical issues that I've been discussing about the uniqueness of the mathematical universe, uh, or if it has a fundamentally plural nature. And so ultimately the question becomes, uh, do we have just one mathematical world or many? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joel, to this, for this really interesting talk, uh, expressing your well-known views. Uh, well, I will let Andre ask, and then we shall sit. Yes, Andre, please go ahead. Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, you seem to be pointing to our, what could be called perhaps the internal logic of uh, the multiverse. In a way, your description of CH not being, you know, uh, you know, being settled, but being settled, not that you say, oh, it holds or it doesn't hold, but somehow saying that how it holds somewhere, how it doesn't hold somewhere else. Or maybe some other questions that uh, uh, I think, uh, I think you mentioned situations where uh, you may have situations that may be forced, or the opposite may be forced, but it's very difficult to force one of the two sides. So even if uh, the two, you know, pi and its negation may be forced, Forcing phi may be extremely easy, forcing many forcing extensions or many you know, wire constructions such as those you mentioned. And it takes a lot of power to force the negation of the state. That happens, you know, the diamond principles, negations of diamond principles, they tend to be kind of a, almost everywhere type of situations. And then the how that you were kind of pushing to the end in, in, a, in a very beautiful uh, way, I think. You know, we know about CH and we know we have been you know, for a century learning how it may hold, how it may fail. And uh, are you pointing towards some kind of a implicit logic that we don't know about or that we can use? You know, I'm not talking about any of the existing logics, but uh, are you kind of trying to point towards such a thing? Right. So, okay. So, uh, so thank you for the question, um, Andres. And, uh, uh, I, I'm not pointing towards a particular logic here, although some of my other work can be seen as uh, as investigating the, those kind of issues. For example, um, uh, if you look at the modal logic of forcing, then it's, I think, connected with part of what you were saying. So if we take a model of set theory and we look at it in the context of it's what's called the generic multiverse, which is not the whole multiverse, but just this tiny part of it, of the models that you can get to by forcing, you know, then it's naturally seen as a cryptic model where something is possible if there is a, some forcing notion that makes it true and, and the statement is necessary if it's true in all forcing extensions. And then one can ask, well, what is the logic of that modality? Yeah, what is the modal logic exhibited by forcing? And Benedict Lover and I proved right that the modal logic of forcing is exactly S4.2 
uh, which if you know what that means, then it will be meaningful to you, but otherwise. So we identify exactly the fundamental modal principles and um, uh, and, and, and prove that it, it exactly captures the modal logic in the case with parameters. When you don't have parameters, then actually you can have models that have S5 and the maximality principle, which I think was the subject of the pre earlier talks here. Um, and so, uh, so that's a way of seeing what is the, uh, what is the logic governing, say, forcing possibility. Yeah. And then also another way to answer the question, again, with modal logic is to look at, say, the models of set theory as a kind of potentialist view. You know? so, so maybe we think of the set theoretic universe as inherently unfinished, you know? so that any given model of set theory could be extended. So we could have a, a height potentialist view where basically one can imagine, say, the models of the actual models of set theory could be any given rank initial segment and building up higher and higher, but it's never completed. You can always go more. And this has very strong affinities with the Aristotelian potentialist idea about potential infinity, but it separates this potentialist idea from the connection with infinity, which just that Potentialism is really about partially completed universes. And if we look at set theory as potentialist in that sense, then we would want to ask, what is the logic? What is the modal logic governing the possibility operator? So something is possible if there's a larger, uh, a larger realm in, in which it's true. And so if you have the rank potentialism picture, um, uh, 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 this sort of linearly ordered hierarchy of possible worlds, then you're going to validate exactly S4.3. The linearity gives you the 0.3 axiom. Yeah. Um, but th there's a sense in which these potentialist views, uh, if they're combined with a view that the, the way that the universe is extending is somehow inevitable. You know? So if you, if you really think about, say, rank potentialism as about the V alphas converging to a unique V, you know, then that's sort of implicitly actually as you're saying, well, really, I could just take the, the union of all the possible worlds that I might ever get to, and that's a kind of set theoretic realm of its own. You know? And a more radical kind of potentialism is to give up on that inevitability and say, well, look, maybe I'm going to do rank potentialism and the universe could be extended, but if I take a different extension, maybe they can't be amalgamated together. Yeah? If I give up on that amalgamation idea, then I get this sort of branching tree of possibility. Maybe if I extend in a certain way, then it's going to be fundamentally incompatible with incorporating the things that I would have gotten if I had extended differently. Yeah. And we've analyzed that. And we can prove, for example, that in this radical branching form of potentialism, uh, you get exactly um, S4 only and not 0.2 or 0.3 or anything, just only S4. And this is connected with the sort of uh, universal definability results and so on that I proved with Wooden and uh, with Cameron Williams, my student and so on. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question because I'm not sure that you were asking about the modal logic, but I view the discussions of multiverse is inherently modal because you're talking basically about possible worlds. So there is this definite modal aspect to the question. Yeah, I was thinking maybe that the question that Andres had uh, could be simplified. Maybe the answer could be simplified. All that we have here is comes from our belief in first order logic. So, so all the phenomena you described come from first order logic. And all the incompleteness uh, phenomena we discussed and independence phenomena we discussed come from first order logic. Uh, so it seems to me one can be perfectly Platonist and think that there is a world of mathematics and then simply say, well, the first order logic doesn't describe fully this world of mathematics. So that's one possible definition. Or maybe we can, as a, I think this is maybe where you were going on this, uh, say that, well, you know, what's so special about first order logic? We have studied second order logic. We know that set theory and second order logic is not very exciting, but there are many logics and uh, we have other, like the logic you mentioned, and perhaps we should just get used to the idea that uh, there is more than one logic and that uh, logics describe partially 
the world around us and that in certain circumstances we use certain logics and as long as there isn't too much contradiction we should learn how to live with this as we should learn how to live with the multiculturalism in real life <laughs> what do you think of that yeah i think that's great i agree with with much of what you said if i would add something and um um uh, so logicians often make this distinction between the object theory and the meta theory. I mean, the object theory, if you're, if you're analyzing the power of say a, a theory, a first order theory or any kind of theory, then to work in the object theory means to assume that theory and then make deductions and so on and to reason uh, under the assumption that that theory is true. Whereas to make meta theoretic claims or analysis is to prove things about the theory. So independence results and so on are often proved uh, in the meta theory of a theory. We analyze DFC meta theoretically by proving relative consistency results and so on. And, and, and oftentimes the sort of um, uh, 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 significance of independence results and in the sort of meta, uh, the multiverse perspective is, is occurring in the meta theory. Okay, so now the point I wanna make though is that if you have a truly pluralist conception of the nature of mathematical reality, so you have a lot of different mathematical universes, including uh, set theoretic universes, then each mathematical universe provides, in a sense, its own meta theoretic context for analyzing logic and theories. It has its own collection of models, it has its own proofs, and so on. And those can change as you change the meta, the you know, the, the the model of set theory that you're living in, you might have different proofs or more proofs or more theories or different models and so on. And so, uh, so, so the object theory, meta theory distinction is too crude. We have rather this entire hierarchy of meta theories. Any model of set theory can be seen as a meta theoretic context for the theories and models that exist in that model. And, uh, and so the, the maybe a different way of answering Andres's question is uh, is to say, well, look, the the particular logic is going to change a lot as you change the set theoretic universe you're living in. Then you've changed the infinitary proofs, and you've changed the theories, and you've changed the models that are available, and so um, and so you're going to have different logics all over the place, precisely because you have different meta theoretic right. contexts all over the place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have time for one extra question because there was one there. Yes. Yeah, I don't understand how it uh, explains the ontology uh, between the uh, uh, ideas. Because um, when you take the analogy with the geometry uh, and you say, uh, the parallel axiom is not true. It depends on what geometry you take. Uh, you are not saying that both uh, possibility exists. You are saying that there is a bigger universe in which you can use both of uh, uh, the the possibility. And in in that setting, you have uh, a view of the multiverse where. It is not that they uh, all exist in parallel, but more that there is a bigger universe in which you can use well, uh, either of the, the visions. So I didn't, I'm not sure if I got all of that, but are you saying that somehow in certain contexts, it's not just that there are alternative universes, but rather that they become enlarged in a way of encom encompassing many possibilities? Is that what the question is about? I didn't quite get it. I, I'm saying that uh, in a, in a not <laughs> I'm saying that uh, in a non-political matter, uh, maybe, well, uh, what uh, what is said with the uh, multiverse view is not that there is uh, a, a lot of uh, possibility of existence, but more there is that there is a, a, a bigger universe, including all of these point of view. Oh, I see. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to describe uh, with, for example, I in my in my multiverse paper that Myrna had mentioned. Mm -hmm. I present a list of multiverse axioms, and one of them is basically trying to do what you're talking about. I think um, 
Uh, so when we have a lot of different, say we have a model of set theory, which we can view as a set theoretic universe and we have all of its forcing extensions and so on, then maybe there's an extension, a larger universe in which that original universe exists as a set and all those forcing extensions also exist as sets. And so it's a way of turning sort of what used to be a kind of meta-theoretic analysis into part of the object theory now, because those old universes become just objects in the new universe and can be analyzed mathematically there. I think it has some affinity with the way that you were describing. So we have all these different possibilities, but if we just kind of make a step up, then we're looking down and maybe the original universe is just looking like a countable transitive model of set theory now with all of its extensions and so on. And those can be analyzed just as countable structures. Thanks a lot, Joel. Uh, well, there was a question uh, from the audience online. Uh, what's the boundary between religious belief and belief in foundation of mathematics? So maybe you can answer this question and we'll slowly start packing because we need to go. Uh, oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. So, oh, I don't know. Please, thank you. Boundary. Let's see. So, I mean, if anything, um, when you have a situation where the, um, in the universe, you are pointed at this epistemological problem about even if you believe that there's this one true universe, then we seem not to be able uh, to have any proper method for, for learning about what the truths of that universe are. And so those questions become fundamentally philosophical, or you might say religious, I guess, in light of this question, sort of how is it that we come to know about what's true in the one true universe if you're a universe is? Whereas for the multiverses, the project isn't really to come to know what's true, but rather to exhibit the diversity of possibility. And that can be done by mounting these kind of forcing arguments or other kind of arguments to build the universes that exhibit the alternative truths. So maybe that's one way of answering the question, but I'm sorry, it's probably not very satisfactory. Thank you very much, Joel. Really I hope that next time you come here in person. Thanks, everybody. Yes, I hope so. Yes, I would really enjoy it, I think. Thank you. I'm sorry that we have to leave. That's the rule of the building. Okay. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye.